Welcome back to the studio. I'm here in the heart of the Kazakh capital, North Sultan. My name is Lezat Shatayev. I'm a journalist, a TV host, and producer at Kazakh TV. Uh, tune in and stay with us because we're about to start an interesting discussion on the world post-pandemic, uh, post-COVID-19, and how the pandemic uh, will affect the sustainable future, our sustainable future. Uh, I am joined by a, an impressive panel, uh, an impressive speakers, yeah, joining me from South Korea. Korea is the chair of the international award, the Global Energy Prize, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Mr. Ray Kwon Chong. Mr. Chong, welcome. Thank you. Uh, joining us from Belgium, Chief, Chief Strategy Officer of the Astana International Financial Center, Mr. Alexander Van der Put. Mr. Put, good morning, good day. Good morning. It's Van der Put, actually, my last name. It's not Put. Thank you. Wonder put. It's put. Uh, thank you. Uh, and the professor of South Kazakhstan State University, head of a project called Water Harmony for Global Sustainability, Development, Innovation and Peace, Mr. Malik Jekiev. Mr. Jekiev, welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, we are going to go into um, a short, uh, your short speeches. Uh, so let's start with uh, what you see as sustainable sustainable development. What are some of the sustainable sustainable development strategies are, Mr. Chung? The mic is yours. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me let me start by defining uh, the basic uh, nature of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, many people can think of it as a kind of a health and a medical problem. But uh, from what I see, from my perspective, this is not just a medical problem or health problem. It is actually a warning call from the nature for the uh, uh, ecological crisis, uh, which is happening everywhere around the world as we are moving through the using too much fossil fuel and destroying the nature habitat. So we have to define the coronavirus pandemic as an ecological crisis. And the, the more interesting thing is, this is just a, from my perspective, is a beginning of a much larger ecological crisis, which is including the climate change. And so this is a kind of a harbinger of a much bigger ecological crisis like the climate change, which is already happening as well. So uh, we should not only thinking about treating medical solutions, but delivering vaccines for people. That's not the uh, fundamental solution for our sustainable future for our future. So uh, my uh, main message is that we have to think about the basic nature of the corona pandemic crisis. So it is an ecological crisis. It's not just a health and medical problem. Then we have to understand why this kind of ecological crisis has happened and what we should do. So everybody knows it already that the climate change has been going on. And this is a coronavirus pandemic. It's just a one part of the ecological crisis, including climate change. Then we have to think about how we can make our future a lot more sustainable in order to avoid another coronavirus pandemic coming up again in the future. So we have to fundamentally think about how can we transform the way we operate our economy, society, and the environment, which, in, which means social development per se. So uh, what I want to emphasize here is that we are going to have a, a lot more difficult challenge because many countries around the world are now thinking about economic recovery after we uh, handle the medical problems. Then if we want fast and the recovery, economic recovery after the coronavirus pandemic, then we will also repeat the same production and consumption pattern based on fossil fuel and we will keep on uh, emitting a lot more greenhouse gases, as well as we will continue to destroy the ecological habitat. So we have to think about 
when we think about our sustainable future, then economic recovery, then how can you make our economic recovery greener and ecologically sound and sustainable? That is going to be a lot more difficult challenge for our future. So this is a, some kind of a challenge we are facing in front of us. But I have a lot of ideas on how we can handle this kind of challenge, but I will stop here and I will come back later what I'm thinking about for the solution for this kind of ecological crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Um, Professor Van der Poot. Uh, thank you. And, and I would fully agree with Professor Chung is that basically uh, it, it's a reaction from nature. After all, we have uh, made many uh, species extinct and, and, and as a result, our natural defenses okay. as well. Uh, the, uh, I will uh, uh, have a look at uh, it from a risk pr uh, perspective. So if you contrast, for example, uh, COVID-19 with global climate change, they're inherently different from a, a global risk perspective. Uh, at the World Economic Forum uh, in 2002, we launched the Global Risk Report. And um, I, I was at the time at, at, at the forum and Dr. Cherry Malare actually managed that, uh, that initiative. And we make the distinction between two types of risks, but they were all considered as global risks. Uh, number one is uh, those that actually have low probability but high impact, and those that actually have high probability and also high impact. Now, pandemics are in the first category. And, and therefore, they considered a wild card or black swan. They emerge rapidly and therefore also uh, require a rapid response. If you look at global climate change, on the other hand, that actually emerges gradually. And therefore, this takes many people by surprises. We tend to be blindsided. And, and therefore, we have not been uh, largely um, proactive in addressing it. So global climate change, if you consider within the context of what we're currently facing, is a much bigger risk, but it happens much more gradually, and the time is there to react quickly now if we are going to emerge from this crisis uh, with more resilience and actually more sustainably. Uh, I will keep it there as well, similar to Professor Chung. Uh, I will wait for recommendations later on. But I think it's important to understand the context of the pandemic within the global risk uh, landscape. Uh, back to you, moderator. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Van der Poot. Uh, Mr. Jacquet, would you like to add to that? Safety. Depletion in, in pollution of water resources occupies a special place among national environment and problems. As you know, the Republic of Kazakhstan has a huge natural resource of raw materials. Among them are oil, gas, coal, ferrous, non ferrous, and precious metals, uranium, phosphorus, and much more. But at the same time, Kazakhstan belongs to the category of countries with a shortage of water resources. From the time of the accelerated industrialization of Kazakhstan in the 20th century to the present, water bodies have been in intensively polluted by many metallurgical and chemical industries, municipal services of cities, and represent a real environmental threat. Groundwater, which is the main source of drinking water supply for the population, is also susceptible to pollution. I'm not even talking about the well-known disaster of uh, drying up the Aral Sea. To solve the problems of conservation, restoration, and rational use of water resources, the government of Kazakhstan is taking all possible measures with the allocation of significant financial resources. One of the main directions and the mechanism of ensuring environmental safety is greening society through environmental education and upbringing scientific support of environmental safety, environmental advocacy, and public participation 
expansion of international cooperation. For the development of uh, environmental education as a basis of the formation of the environmental culture of society, it is necessary. First, the formation of a system of continuous uh, environmental education by introduced environmental and sustainable development issues into the curricula of all level of education. Second, training of specialists, retraining and advanced training of personnel in the field of ecology from all levels of the system of compulsory and additional education. Third, state support for environmental education. Fourth, use of international experience in solving problems of environmental safety. And five, activation of attracting funds from international organizations for the solution of specific programs and projects in the field of environmental protection and sustainable development of the country. One of the examples of international cooperation is in various field, fields of science and education is the International Education Norwegian Eurasian Project Water Harmony dedicated to the world's water problems, which are most urgent for the countries of Central Asia. The main coordinator of this project is the world famous scientist and teacher, Professor Harsha Ratnavira from the Norwegian University of Applied Sciences. I am the project coordinator from Kazakhstan. The project began uh, in 2011 and continues to present day. It is dedicated to wastewater treatment, drinking water treatment, and integrated water resources management. Currently, water treatment and management specialist water resources are scarce, or their qualification is not need more than requirements. The Water Harmony Project focuses on training specialists, which are a dire need of the partner countries' economies. Participation in this project allowed us, together with scientists and educators of a consortium of 10 universities in seven countries, Norway, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Moldova, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, to develop and harmonize, harmonize educational programs of water topics at the world level, to teach our students in undergraduate programs, graduate and PhD doctors, uh, the annual summer school at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Exchange students for training and teaching for advanced training at partner universities. Open new research laboratories uh, with the renewal of the modern equipment. In collaboration with partners, write a textbook for the high school and publish it in seven languages of the participants. Also participate in many world exhibition and in of achievement in the area of wastewater treatment and drinking water preparation. Make friends, our students and teachers from around the world learn their history and culture. All this had a beneficial effect of improving of quality of teaching our students, improving the qualification of academic teachers and establishing friendship between peoples. We are pleased to note the expansion of our network, a project uh, that currently units 50 universities from 33 countries. We believe that the Water Harmony project allows to raise the professional level of our graduates, increases the attractiveness for training and research, so why positively uh, influencing uh, the greening and promotion of the ecological culture of society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhikiev. Uh, gentlemen, I have my first question to you from what you have just said. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder of a basic fact uh, that uh, animal, plant, ecosystem, and human health and well-being are intrinsically connected and are profoundly uh, impacted and affected by human activities. Uh, moving forward, uh, out, and hopefully out of the pandemic soon, uh, how how can we start thinking more holistically and approaching the way we organize our economy uh, in a more balanced and sustainable way? Mr. Professor Chung, would you like to weigh in? Okay, <laughs> let me try. Yeah, it is a very challenging question. And uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that um, 
while we are pursuing economic growth and we all the government and the politicians, business and the people are focused on short term return. And they are very anxious to maximize short term GDP economic growth. So mm -hmm. at the expense of nature and also society. So this has been our development strategy. But we have to move away from this kind of extreme short termism toward a long termism, which is respecting the nature as well as the society. It will be quite difficult. And especially the you know, government fiscal policy will be very important for that because government has the power to change the tax system and the price mechanism in the market. Uh, but uh, it is not easy even for the government because they have to worry about industrial competitiveness and productivity, short-term productivity, not only for the long-term challenges. So this has been always a challenge for government. And the private sector is facing that challenge that they have to survive and that they have to maximize their short-term return. So this is a kind of a very contradicting uh, forces between the private sector as well as from the government and from the nature. Then I think uh, what is very important is that uh, we all have to understand and uh, provide the political support to the government for long from a transformation from ex extreme short termism toward a long termism that respect nature and the people, not just uh, uh, growing the maximizing short term growth and profit at the expense of people and the nature. We can no longer can pursue that if we are going to survive. The COVID-19 is a warning signal to all of us that if we continue just uh, blindfolded by the extreme short-termism and pursuing just a profit, short-term profit at the expense of nature and the people, then we will end up our own uh, extinction. Oh, we, there's no guarantee for our survival. So we have to fundamentally change our mindset and we have to change our fiscal policy and the way the finance, financing is functioning. Because, because you know, Professor Van der Food is a, a financial specialist supporting AIFC, but the financing is a very critical factor in bridging the gap between the short-term investment and the long-term return. Mm -hmm. So actually, but the private fund and the financing cannot do all. It has to be supported by the public policy and the public financing as well. I will stop here. Uh, thank you, Professor Chong. Uh, to continue your, your thought and your idea, I would like to ask this question to Professor uh, Vandeput. Uh, Mr. Vandeput, the pandemic has made countries to retrench and look inwards to build, rebuild their own economies and to shore them up. Uh, and that's the trend that we are looking at uh, at the moment. Uh, and there's a rising nationalism uh, seen everywhere across the world. Um, that going away from international community or from cooperation to solve a larger global challenges and issues, um, how do you think the pandemic affected that process? Did you, do you think it accelerated that process? Um, what, is it, what is its imp impact? Well, it, it, it's a fascinating question. And, and I'm not saying that I'm, uh, I have all the answers, but I think in, in, in some degree, it has actually uh, divided us, but in other areas, actually, uh, it, it is potentially uh, aligning us in order to help address even the bigger challenges. Mm -hmm. What I think that COVID-19 has uh, made apparent is that the way we have designed the economy and to build upon uh, what uh, Professor Chung was saying is that basically uh, short-termism has led to unsustainable, uh, unsustainable development, but also has clearly emphasized that our economic model is not resilient. Uh, look at global value chains. They're not resilient the way we have designed them right now. Look at our global energy system. It's also not resilient. Um, where I do see pockets of cooperation, actually, it's actually largely driven by the scientific community. It's mm. unfortunately not driven 
by the uh, political community. And, and I think it's those countries that actually give a voice to the scientific community that actually will probably emerge from this crisis in a better way uh, because they also look at sharing ideas and, and, and sharing uh, prospects about how to get uh, out of this crisis, not just as a pandemic, but also uh, for the benefit of humanity. And, and let me very quickly build upon what Dr. Chung said, but repeating a, um, a video ad that I saw on TV about two years ago. And it was nature speaking. And nature said the following, if you don't take care of me, I cannot take care of you. And that is, that is at the essence of the whole thing. Uh, we will eventually be extinct. So we need to take care of nature and we need to look at the longer term and we can only do that by working collaboratively. Not about just addressing the pandemic, but by addressing our global challenges. And unfortunately, we tend to look inwards, but we should be looking outwards. We should reach out to other parties in order to solve our problems collectively. Uh, back to you, moderator. Thank you. Uh, Professor Van der Poel, I'd like to follow up on this. Um, the pandemic has made us think, rethink the economic models we, uh, we operate in. Uh, it also made us think the way we govern, the way the administrations work. Um, do you think the pandemic will actually be a catalyst or a setback to rethinking the way we operate, the way we organize as societies? Well, uh, again, the, uh, and, and Dr. Chung probably wants to help address this as well, but the, um, uh, I, I think that governance is a big part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I would like to uh, go back to the, some of the comments that Dr. Chung made uh, and, and, and the role that governance actually plays in, in addressing our common challenges. If you look at the United Nations development goals, there's 17 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one can easily group them into five buckets. One is natural capital. The other one is manufactured capital. Then we have social, human, and financial capital. And I think what governance should be concerned with is actually balancing and growing all five at the same time not one to the detriment of the other. What we have been doing exactly is depleting natural capital. We haven't really uh, developed inclusive societies and then looking at maximizing financial capital and again in the short term. So governance actually plays a very important role in actually balancing and growing all five capital stocks simultaneously, not one to the detriment of the other. And actually at the AIFC, you refer to uh, the organization uh, where I'm currently working. It's actually our mission. Our mission is to balance and grow all five capital stocks in attracting and channeling investments in the economy. And there is an increasingly, uh, an increasing understanding that actually ESG compliant investments pay off. They have a higher return than non-ESG compliant. Uh, there was an Amundi study, for example, uh, that came out two years ago, and the returns of ESG compliant assets have in, in excess of 3.3% financial return. So doing good for society, doing good for nature is also good for the shareholder. And it's that shift in mindset that's going to be required. Win-win versus trade-offs. Thank you. Uh, Professor, Professor Van der Poot, would you like to explain what an ESD compliant products are to our oh. viewers? Some of them are very young. I, I, I do apologize, and I should not be using acronyms indeed. <laughs> ESG stands for uh, Environmental Societal Governance. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's about sustainability. But it's a, it's a common term that is being used uh, about sustainability in the investment community. So it, E stands for environmental, S for uh, social, societal, and G for governance. And they have to work all together. 
Um, Mr. Chung, uh, uh, going back to you, uh, you were the ambassador for climate change for, for many years. And in a discussion for sustainable about the sustainable development, uh, fossil fuels are one of the uh, biggest topics and environmental or climate change, environmental damage is one of the main challenges we're faced with globally. Uh, there are 35, we burn fossil fuels uh, that and produce 35 billion uh, tons of carbon dioxide every year. Uh, billions of tons are actually um, creating a, an environmental crisis. Going further, what do you see as, where do you see the future for energy? Okay, before I go touch on the issue of energy, let mm -hmm. me uh, just uh, support what uh, Professor Pandafut just uh, mentioned Please. about the five capitals. And so, yeah, I totally support and agree. It is uh, the way we, sh this, this should be the way we go forward. Mm -hmm. But to do that, I'd like to emphasize this point. It cannot be done by the market. It cannot be done by the private sector. It has to be by the government leadership with a strong vision and the long-term strategy, but that requires political support from the people. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, even in many countries, like including United, uh, United States, people don't provide the political support for climate action. It's very deplorable, sad story, that uh, the largest country in the world, the people are only talking about short-term profit and the fast bucks, so they don't care about the climate change. This is really a very, very deplorable and a sad situation. So my, my first point, government is only the government that can play the role of mm -hmm. promoting balanced way of five capitals for, the, for our future. It cannot be done by the market. But in order to do that, we have to overcome the ideological brainwashing by the neoliberal school saying that we have to leave everything to the market and the government shouldn't touch anything. That has been the ideology for the last three decades, since 1990, from the Reagan and Thatcher. And we, all the global economic and the financial system has been functioning based on that neoliberal ideology. So how we can get over, overcome, return, or overturn actually, this kind of ideological brainwashing. So otherwise, otherwise I don't see any hope for that. And another point is, I want to emphasize here, after the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, unfortunately, and very sadly, we, what we are seeing is mm -hmm. each government is just going for, uh, everybody is doing for their own, them, own uh, self. So everybody is doing for themselves, which means they don't care about others that they don't think about all together and solidarity as a group or as a humanity, but each country is just running and pushing for their own self-interest, especially short-term self-interest. This is very tragic. Unless we change this mindset, I think it will be very difficult because Corona, COVID-19 pandemic cannot be overcome until everybody is safe. Just we cannot, you cannot be safe until everybody's safe all around the world. We cannot be, you, just, you cannot be safe if, within your own border. If the other people are the outside of your border, then you cannot be guaranteed of your own safety as well. So we have to think about collective action and partnership. But unfortunately, many of the things we are seeing right now is that everybody just running for their own self-interest especially short-term self -interest. So these are the challenges we have to face. As for the energy transformation, yes, that is a very challenging task for all of us. For me, I have been always saying that in order to transform to a renewable energy future, I don't think we can go for renewable energy transformation without introducing carbon pricing. We have to introduce a carbon tax and the carbon pricing. As long as, as long as we pay, we are emitting CO2 emission without paying any price, then I think it will be very difficult. So then the question is, carbon pricing, can we introduce it without damaging our economic growth and our industry? That has been the concern of the politicians and the business for a long time. And the, yes, 
that is possible. And that there are uh, proofs and empirical evidence in Europe that the European economy has grown 60% and while reducing 25% of emission mm -hmm. by introducing a lot of taxes and the carbon pricing in their business and the, uh, development planning. So this is a kind of empirical evidence that we can transform to a new future with based on renewable energy without killing our economy. So this is a very challenging task and uh, with a lot of issues to discuss about it, but I, I think we don't have enough time for that. So I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chung. You're right when you say that very far too often the, when there's a discussion about climate change, policymakers, politicians always talk about and make a choice between economy and environment. And of course, in the short term, uh, nobody wants to lose jobs. I think it's a, it's a it's a popular idea that you know economy should be kept at a pace it is. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Vandeput, I'd like to ask your opinion on this. Is it always a choice between economy and environment? Can we actually achieve a sustainable, environmentally conscious development uh, without losing on the economy part? Oh, definitely. Uh, and, and, and that's what I referred to uh, previously as well. Joint gains are there. And, and, and I come back to uh, what pro both Professor Chung and I referred to before as the five capital stocks. It's truly about growing and balancing all five at the same time. Um, so what we need to do is we need to change mindsets. And mindsets is a big, a big part of the solution. Uh, but allow me also to build upon, and it may sound like Professor Chung and I uh, prepared this for the last couple of days because we're saying similar things. But let me refer to the Stern report 20 years ago. The cost of global climate change at that time was estimated at about 600 million US dollars. The IMF last year came out of a report that the cost of global climate change just linked to fossil fuels is $5 trillion. Hmm. So over a period of 20 years, we go from 600 million to five trillion. Now, what I think we need to do, and we cannot leave it over to the market, we have to internalize these externalities. By internalizing these externalities, actually, suddenly fossil fuel sector will become uninvestable. And therefore, renewables will be able to um, to flourish. But let me very quickly uh, refer to uh, the United States. And if I would ask you how many people currently, and my data is maybe six months old, but it's still relatively current, how many people are employed in the uh, coal mining in the United States? Well, uh, it's about 60,000 people. So it's not a large number of people. If on the other hand, you look at how many people are, were, are employed in uh, solar panel manufacturing and custom installation and maintenance of solar panels, again in the United States? It's in excess of $2 million, uh, 2 million people. So we have, for a part of the fossil fuel industry, we have uh, 60,000 people. And when we look at renewables, we have not only healthier jobs, we have higher paying jobs, and we have substantially more jobs as well. So, we need to change mindsets. And if we change mindset and we internalize these externalities, what we will see is that certain things will suddenly become much more interesting and the debate about trade-offs will actually largely disappear. We will actually be able to explore joint gains between the five capital stocks and therefore be able to achieve the sustainable development goals as set out by the UN. Uh, gentlemen, Mike. Can I? Absolutely, Mr. Chung, please. Yeah, can I add uh, what uh, Professor Pandafut has just mentioned? I do fully support. It's a matter of mindset that we have been so much obsessed about short termism, short term profit, and short term growth. That's why we don't see the potential for investing in renewables. But uh, that's why, actually, in 2005, I started a new paradigm of green growth, green economic growth. Uh, what I meant by that, 
when I proposed in 2005 that uh, climate change and uh, uh, emission, CO2 emission reduction investment can be a driver of economic growth. That was what I was trying to emphasize. And uh, why I said that? Because I want to change the mindset. Because while I was a climate change ambassador for, and for Korea and then negotiating in the uh, United Nations, I was so much frustrated and so much fed up about the belief uh, dominating the mindset of the people negotiating climate change. They all believe climate change is a disaster for their economy. That is why they are fighting so fiercely to avoid any kind of commitment, especially United States. United States has been fighting 25 years to avoid any kind of legally binding commitment for their economy because they believe it is a killer and a damaging for American economy. So I've been really fed up with this kind of mindset as just Professor Van der Fudde just mentioned, in spite of the fact that renewables will open up new opportunities and blue ocean for economic growth, as well as employment, but still our mindset. Look at the Mr. Trump. He's still believing he's inviting coal miners to the White House. It's crazy. So the mindset is so much old fashioned and maybe three, five decades old. And it's, it's a challenge of just saying change our mindset. Uh, Dr. Chung, how do we change the mindset of the policymakers and, and governments everywhere? How do we bridge? I, I can change yeah. the mindset simply <laughs> by saying that, simply by saying that uh, investing in renewable energy will open up new opportunity for economic growth and job creation. If they believe it, then they will change mindset and that they will be supporting the transformation for renewable energy. Uh, Mr. Jake, if this is for you, uh, so how do we bridge? Uh, in, how do we bridge uh, the gap between the scientific community and the governments to actually address these things? Uh, and you are a representative of an academic. Uh, well, you're an academician yourself. Uh, could you please weigh in on that, Mr. Jake? I think we may have lost the connection. Uh, well, let's further move on. Um, I'm here. Uh, oh, yes, you're here. Mm -hmm. I am completely agree with professors. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I can say once again that the government, uh, each of our country or the world, have uh, many, many problems with COVID 19 pandemic. But I can say once again that the government of Republic of Kazakhstan um, taken all possible measures with allocated of significant financial resources. For example, the simple example, government give to people uh, some money uh, for life without jobs, without job. Uh, is not a big money, is not a little money for life. I think, yes. And the uh, second, your question, why, what? The question was, how do we bridge the gap between the scientific community and the government and the policymakers? Our government uh, always, uh, always supports the uh, scientific academic uh, society. And uh, uh, if we address uh, it if we address it to government, they um, they support and help us uh, in the решение проблем. And so the problems. Uh, I ask you, uh, excuse me, uh, that I, uh, for me is uh, difficult uh, at the time to speak in English because I think in Kazakh or Russian and translate and many Thank you, more. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was an insightful uh, answer. Uh, going back to energy, uh, Dr. Chung, I'd like and 
and Professor Van der Poot, I'd like to know uh, your, your vision on this, because there's an ongoing debate on this here in Kazakhstan as well. Some argue that nuclear can be the key to clean energy transition. The others argue that nuclear energy has no place in a safe and clean, sustainable future. Where do you stand on that? You mean for nuclear energy? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, it is a very sensitive issue. Yeah. Uh, I think the decision has to be made by the people and by the government. Each country made a very different decision. France, for example, in France, France they have decided to go for nuclear, while the Germany decided to get rid of the nuclear. So each country has a very different uh, decision and political. Uh, yeah. So I think in Korea, we are also trying to reduce the share of nuclear. Uh, but I think what is much better than nuclear, the risk is we can pay a little bit more about our energy bill mm. now, and then we can enjoy sustainable future in the, in the long term. So mm. while we are, you know, we now paying a lot of economic cost for, from the COVID-19, mm. some, some, sometime later, we'll pay a lot more for climate disasters. So mm. why don't we pay a little bit more for new renewable energy now, mm -hmm. and we prevent such kind of ecological crisis for the future? I think that is much wiser than just going for nuclear or going for you know ignoring the sign uh, energy transformation. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor Van de Poot, Where do you stand on this? Well. Um... There was a good reason why countries ventured into nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Chung has referred to uh, France. It's about 70% of the electricity generation is coming uh, from nuclear energy. Um, Japan is another country where actually you have a very large share. And, mm -hmm. and the, United States, uh, the United States, Japan and France are probably the ones where you have the largest share as part of the economy. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, and, and given the in uh, local uh, circumstances, for example, Japan will always be a net importer of energy. They don't have indigenous resources, so to speak. Uh, th that seemed to be the right uh, decision to be made. However, we also need to think about the, um, um, the consequences that the unintentional consequences. Uh, don't think about the accidents like Fukushima and Chernobyl, mm -hmm. but also think about the waste. And we currently don't have a, a solution for waste. So if you ask me, is there a future for nuclear? I would say it depends. Is there a, fu a, a future for fu a fission? I would say no. Is there a, fu a future for fusion? I would say yes, because mm -hmm. with fusion, you actually don't have the problem of waste, which we will only postpone to the next generation. And then also we have the problem of decommissioning the plants. Uh, in France, what they're doing, they're actually keeping the plants open much longer because the cost of decommissioning, they want to postpone to the future as opposed to uh, incurring the cost already right now. And then of course, the other question is, how do you replace 70% of uh, your electricity generation in the short term by a viable alternative. So uh, is there a long-term future? No. Uh, it, let me give you a little bit anecdotal evidence as well in addition. In Kazakhstan, there's a company which is called Kazatomprom. Kazatomprom uh, produces 17% of the uranium in the world. The valuation of Kazatomprom the implied valuation, because it's not fully traded, is $6 billion. So take $6 billion, multiply that using a market valuation by a factor of six. So we're arriving at $36 billion. That is the value of nuclear fuel. It's peanuts. It's nothing. The value of solar and wind are substantially higher. In addition, they're free resources. So then the question is, how do we harness them and how do we integrate that? And, and our vision is that we should create a Eurasia renewable energy grid that would be more resilient and that would be composed of both solar and uh, wind. 
with advanced storage solutions and connected with ultra high voltage lines in between. And that system would be substantially more resilient than looking back at technologies or solutions that we implemented 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, that's my view on the situation. Uh, but Dr. Chung wanted to add something, I believe. Dr. Chung? Can I add something? Mm, please. Uh, yeah, uh, for Kazakhstan, my advice for Kazakhstan is that, why mm -hmm. don't you think about exporting renewable energy, not just a fossil fuel or only a nuclear option? You have a huge potential for renewable energy export. You have a huge land spaces. That's why I have been proposing Silk Road Super Grid of producing huge quantity of renewable solar and wind power from the vast land spaces in Kazakhstan, exporting mm -hmm. it to China and Korea. Mm -hmm. Korea, we have no land. Our land is too expensive, impossible for Korea to transform to renewable energy within our border. This is the why the super grid can play a very important role. And I hope President Tokayev supposed to visit Korea sometime after mm -hmm. coronavirus, COVID-19 has come down. Mm -hmm. I hope President Tokayev should propose to Korean President Moon Jae-in. Why don't we work for Silk Road Super Grid? Kazakhstan is ready to export renewable energy from Kazakhstan through China to Korea. Because in, within China, Super Grid is already completed there in China. Mm -hmm. And Korea and China is now building connection from west eastern coast of China to western coast of Korea. It's only 300 kilometers. It's going to be connected within three to four years. It's going to be connected soon. So from Urumqi to Seoul will be connected sooner or later. Then the highway for renewable energy export can be used, utilized for Kazakhstan. So try to think about Kazakhstan becoming a renewable energy exporting country in the world, not just for fossil fuel. Uh, Dr. Chung, just to explain some of our, some of our viewers who are students here, uh, could you please talk about the super grids and how important they are in, um, in allowing renewable energy uh, to travel long distances? Yes, super grid is a new technology that can transmit mm -hmm. the electricity mm -hmm. thousands of kilometers. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have any technological problem for that. China mm -hmm. has already solved it. And China and Kazakhstan already uh, working together in partnership for one belt and the one road uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. So this can be a secret super grid, can be a flagship project for belt and road initiative of China and Korea can join. So this is my proposal. I have been proposing this for already for several years. Uh, if thank I you so much. To, uh, Professor Cho, uh, mm -hmm. I refer to I used a different term, but in essence, it's the same thing. The Eurasia Renewable Energy Internet. And the reason why uh, we call it an internet is because you have, it's similar to an internet. You have multiple nodes. Those are the generation nodes. And you have multiple connections. And these are, on the one hand, the super grid, but also the local grids. But what you also do with renewables, you decentralize energy production. That means that everybody becomes a consumer and a producer of energy. For example, here in Belgium, I have photovoltaics on my roof. And in this climatic conditions, which are far from ideal, mm -hmm. uh, I generate an enormous amount of energy. And the benefit of an internet is, and we're connected now through the real internet, but we don't know how we connect it, and we don't care how we connect it for as long as the connection remained viable. In other words, if you compare the traditional energy infrastructure to a super grid or a renewable energy internet, it's going to be much more resilient. And it's not going to be just from one point to the other point that you supply, it is omnidirectional. And therefore, it's not only sustainable, it's much more resilient and also will contribute to more inclusive growth. And therefore, I would, and, and in addition, Asia will always be a net import of energy 
the same with Europe. So Kazakhstan can actually position itself given low population density and vast resources as, Doc, as Professor Chung has mentioned, as the buckle in the Eurasia Renewable Energy Internet. And it would be win-win for everybody involved. Thank you very much, Professor Van der Poot. Uh, we're about to, well, we're coming to an end of our discussion. Uh, we have two questions from our viewers who are sending their questions online. I'm just gonna read them. Uh, Professor Chung, Dr. Chung, this is, this is for you. Are we close today to climate threats compared to your IPCC report? Yeah, we are getting very close to the deadline. Uh, some, uh, some data saying that we are almost seven years uh, near to the deadline for 1.5 degree. And so we have to take action. We don't have much time to act, actually. Mm -hmm. We are running out of time mm -hmm. unless we act right now. And I think we, it will be quite difficult. Um, we are losing the time. And so uh, we have to act quickly and I hope Kazakhstan can also join this kind of push for the uh, trans energy transformation. Well, let's hope that. Uh, Professor Van der Poot, the question, next question from our viewers is to, to you. Will the pandemic affect the financing of climate initiatives and Paris Agreement as many countries will decrease their budgets? Will, will they decrease their budgets? Well, um, Professor Chung said you cannot leave it over to the market. Mm -hmm. However, uh, so there's a, definitely a role for the government in there. And indeed, uh, government budgets are largely affected. But if you look at the amount of capital that is available, it's about $200 trillion. That money currently cannot find bankable projects. And, uh, and we, we talked about mindsets as well. There's actually a positive on mindsets as well. And it's actually with the younger generation. It's with the millennials and the Gen Z. And those have a different mindset and a different approach to actually global climate change. And if you look just at the millennials, they have inherited from the baby boomers, those were guilty at charge with reference to uh, uh, damaging nature, they have inherited an enormous amount of wealth that actually they're putting to good use. So if we only have to depend on uh, government budgets, uh, we, we will have a challenge. But if it, actually we can create public-private partnerships so that the government can actually provide certain direction, but we, then we can deploy a private capital from properly-minded people actually we will be able to still finance despite the pandemic. That's, I think, uh, my view. Thank you so much, Professor Van der Poot. Just to wrap up uh, and reiterate some of the ideas that were uh, talked about today, uh, what are the biggest lessons learned and the biggest takeaways from the pandemic? Professor, uh, Dr. Chong. Uh, it is, I think I can, I can uh, highlight the fact that the government has to take a very important role Mm -hmm. in making the transformation. Uh, as just Professor Bandafer just mentioned, you are quite right. I agree totally with you. So when I said market cannot deliver this, meaning that unless government introduce a the price structure, tax system, or mm -hmm. carbon pricing, then the uh, private investment cannot be bankable. So it is a role of the government to make the renewable energy project as a bankable project it is a role of the government. Market alone, they cannot do it themselves. So mm -hmm. it is a role of the government. And then we can release $200 trillion from the Wall Street. They are waiting where to go. They don't know where to go because renewable energy at the moment has a very low uh, profitability. That, but if, if government introduce a carbon pricing and the fossil fuel becomes uneconomical, and why renewable energy becomes more economical and profitable, then $200 trillion will come to everywhere and they will invest for huge quantity of renewable energy. Then we can, so what I'm saying is, the role of the government has to be reconfirmed what they should do. Their role is to make the cap private capital to do the job, not themselves. Government should not try to do it themselves with their own budget and with their own fiscal money because their fiscal budget is a peanuts.
compared to the private uh, two hundred trillion dollars in Wall Street. So, government should uh, clearly understand what is their role. Their role is to make the renewable energy as a bankable project. Then leave it to the market. Then market will solve the problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor Van de Poot, would you like to add what are some of the hard learned lessons during the pandemic for the humanity? Well, in, in terms of solution, I fully agree with, uh, with Professor Chung. I hope, yes, at least for me, that lesson is very clear, but I hope it's a more universally clear uh, lesson, is that COVID-19 has made very apparent that we have not created, nor a sustainable, but not also an inclusive and definitely not a resilient society. Mm -hmm. This is our imperative. This is our opportunity. I don't want to call it a challenge. I want to call it an opportunity that actually we start looking differently at the way we're going to build societies, especially that we're growing from 7.8 to about 10 billion people uh, by 2050, 2060. There is no alternative. We have to fundamentally change. And I really hope that COVID-19 has made that apparent, not just in my mind, it was already the case in my mind, but actually around the world, including the person who currently occupies the White House, although that will probably never happen. Uh, back to you, moderator. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time. I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Chung, Professor Van de Poot, and Professor Jeke for joining us today. What a pleasure and an absolute thrill to be talking to you today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was a thank pleasure, Professor Chung. Yeah. It was a, it was a pleasure. Yeah. This time uh, on uh, Zoom, last time it was in Almaty in person. And okay. Professor Jekeyev, lovely meeting you online as well. Okay, lovely and to the moderator. You. Lovely job okay. you have done. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.